All right, so welcome everyone. Hi, good morning. So we are actually, I am actually going to perform the lab for you today. Um, so you get to see it. <clears throat> And we'll do one together where we calculate everything together. And then I'll do another one. And you'll write down the data, the measurements, right? And then you'll go ahead and um, we'll get into your groups again and in the breakout rooms and calculate the molar mass of the gas again with the data that we collect together. So, um, Great, so yeah, so what's the purpose of the lab today? What are we determining experimentally? What are we calculating and determining experimentally today? Mm -hmm. The molar mass of a gas, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've got everything here. The only thing I don't have is the thermometer, so we're going to estimate the temperature <laughs> in the room. So hopefully that doesn't throw us off too much. It will. It'll definitely be a source of error, so you can talk about that when you're writing up your lab. But I've got my balance and I've got everything else. So yeah, molar mass of gas. Okay, the gas happens to be which one? Does anyone know the formula for this gas here? Stop focusing on me, focus on the bottle. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> All right. Anyone know the formula for that? Yeah, C4H10. Yep. All right. So that's the thing is like you, we're going to be able to compare the molar mass that we calculate experimentally, that we determine experimentally with the molar mass that we should be getting, right, based off of it being butane. So you all can calculate the molar mass um, of butane using our class. Um, periodic table, it's on the like lecture website, it's probably even on our lab website, let me see, our lab modules real quick. Come on, Canvas. <laughs> okay, great. All right, go now. Thank you. Let's see, do we have a periodic table here? Yes, we do. We have our periodic table on the Canvas modules and lab materials. So when you're calculating the molar mass of butane today to compare our results to that, um, you can use the periodic table on the module, okay, lab materials. I've got an announcement for us, one second. All right, so can you, so in the lab, I'll be posting this in the lab announcement. but you already see it in the lecture announcements if you're in my lecture, where I made a Google form. I'm gonna share my screen. I made a Google form and I'd like you to let me know how it's been going for you and the switch to online. So please fill out this Google form. I'll be attaching it to an announcement in the lab, right, in our Chem3 announcements. But, um, yeah, so you can click it in the lecture 
which I'll mention again in lecture if you're in my lecture today. And if you're just in lab with me, I'll be posting this link in the lab announcement so you'll have access to it. So I just like to know how it's been going for you, how it's been going for everyone. Um, and so, yeah. And good. So let's see a little bit of pre lab notes here. We haven't talked yet in lecture about the ideal gas law, but that's okay. We're going to learn about it here. We're going to actually calculate the molar mass of a gas using the ideal gas law. So the ideal gas law is a relationship, it's an equation. It's really an equation that tells us the relationship between pressure, temperature, right, volume, and number of moles of a gas. And it is written like this, PV equals NRT. Okay, so the pressure times the volume of the gas is equal to the number of moles, so this is pressure. This is volume. This is moles. This is the universal gas constant. And this is temperature. And lowercase n is how we're going to um, symbolize moles in the coming gas uh, sections here in lecture and in lab. Okay, so PV equals nRT. So what are we going to be measuring today? What variables did you write out in your data tables that we're going to be measuring today? What variables will we be measuring today? Volume, mass, pressure, and temperature, right? Are we going to be measuring the number of moles? How are we gonna get the number of moles? Mm -hmm. Yep, pressure, volume, temperature, mass, right? Moles are in the noble gas equation. How do we get moles? Yeah, exactly. We can rearrange this equation to solve for moles. So let's do that, right? M is equal to, therefore, right? PV over RT. Right? Moles. And so once we take the number of moles, right, once we calculate the number of moles, we can calculate molar mass because we're also going to be measuring the mass of the gas that we use today, right? So we're gonna be measuring the pressure and really I'm looking up the barometric pressure in Santa Cruz today. Um, and the volume, which we're going to be measuring together, right? We're going to be measuring the temperature, really. It's going to be an estimate. Unfortunately, I don't have a thermometer, but we'll work with it. And then R is a number that is equal to 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. So the temperature today is going to have to be converted into Kelvin. The volume is going to be have to going to have to be converted into um, into liters, and the pressure of the gas is going to have to be in the unit of atmosphere. The unit of atmosphere is useful because air pressure, like atmospheric pressure at sea level, is around one atmosphere. So at sea level right? It's about one atmosphere. And on any given day, you know, it's a little higher or lower. Um, 
today we'll see what the atmospheric or the barometric pressure is and then use that to calculate the pressure of the gas today. Okay, so then molar mass. is equal to the number of grams, right? So the mass in grams over the number of moles that you calculated from the ideal gas law. The mass we're going to be measuring, I do have a balance. Okay. So we measure the pressure, the volume, the temperature, and the mass. Right, we calculate moles from those things and then we use this equation, right? Molar mass is number of grams per mole of the gas. Okay, and then we're going to compare our experimental, right, molar mass to the theoretical molar mass. Okay, so we'll do that um, toward the end. So questions here about like the route that we're taking. We're going to be doing it together. But I think like in the beginning, just understanding what we're measuring, what we're calculating is good going into it. Questions here about, so this again is the ideal gas law. We'll be learning about it in lecture together with me or with your instructor if you haven't already. And just a little background on the universal gas constant, this number here, this number R is actually equal to the slope of the line if you plot the pressure and volume, or the pressure times volume, right? On the y-axis and the moles times temperature of the gas on the x-axis. So R, right, is the proportionality constant between pressure times volume and moles times temperature, right? It's kind of like a Y equals MX plus B thing, right? The slope is equal to the constant here. So that's where that number comes from. Okay, so questions before we begin. Make sure you're writing down all of these notes because you'll need it to calculate after you're let loose, after we take some data after the first calculation step that we do. All right. Okay, so let's go forward. I'm going to move the camera a little bit. Okay, so let's actually, let's set up and make sure we have a good looking um, table together first, right? So everyone's got this. So you need to you needed to come here with um, enough tables for two trials. Um, this is what a good table would look like here. So we could say trial. We'll say trial zero <laughs> because that's the one that we're going to do together. Okay. Huh. OK, 
Okay. So we need, we're going to be measuring the, let's see, the mass of the gas. We're going to say actually mass of canister initial. Mass of canister final. Okay. We're going to need the volume of the water displaced. Right. We're going to need the temperature. And we're going to need the barometric pressure. Oops. Okay, and then from there, we'll be doing a calculation to calculate the pressure of the gas. Okay. All right, so I'll be writing in these lines, right? Whenever we get, a, you know, a piece of data. So you can do that too, right? I'm just gonna have the camera, you know, focused on what we're doing together over here. Okay. Everyone got that, by the way? Everyone good on what we have up on the board, what a good table includes today? Great, thank you for answering. How many gases? So just one, just butane. Just butane, which is good to just do one gas because then the more trials you do, the more your error will, you know be at least averaged out <laughs> between the trials. So what you'll do today is calculate the molar mass for each. And then if they're within 10% of each other, you can calculate the average of them. Right, it's good to see your technique or, you know, as the case may be, my technique improve hopefully over the trials, right? <laughs> um, okay, so let's go over here. Okay, so we've got everything set up right here. And all right, so I've got my beaker of water, right? That's in the first step there. It says to add 500 milliliters, but I found that isn't enough. So I have my students add 700 milliliters of water, and this is just tap water. And it's good to keep it out to get it first because you want the temperature to equilibrate to the room temperature. Um, you want it to like equilibrate in temperature so that it's not going to warm up after you take the temperature later, right? So we kind of wait until the end, usually until we take the temperature. Again, I really wish I had a thermometer. It's unfortunate, but I'm estimating the temperature in the room. And by the time this equilibrates to that temperature, we'll have maybe a good idea of what it is. All right. So what we're going to do next is set up the Erlenmeyer flask. And the way we want to do this is by, I'll show you, I'll get it full in my sink over here, and then I'll do it over the beaker. So you want to fill it up to the very, very brim. You don't want any air bubbles in it. So I've got my Erlenmeyer filled to the brim with water. And then you're gonna place this stopper into the flask. So that it kind of displaces a little bit of the water so that you don't have any air bubbles in the flask because we want the volume 
that the gas displaces today from this flask to be the volume of the actual gas, not the volume of any air trapped in there. So just want it to be in there pretty tightly. This stopper is a little big for this, so I'm kind of jamming it in there to make sure it doesn't fall out. Usually they're a little smaller and you actually don't want to jam them in too much because then they're hard to get out. But that's okay. All right, so I'm going to dry this off so that I can place tape around the stem, uh, around the stem of it. Because the tape is going to allow us to mark the level of the gas that displaces the water once we get there. So I've got some masking tape. And the trick is to like wrap it around several times in the same place so that it doesn't come off in the water. I kind of want to just like on the straight part. Okay. So that should stay on there. All right, a place to mark when we're ready. All right. And so. Now we can place the flask upside down, right? So we don't have any air bubbles, no air bubbles, only water in there, none at all. All right, so then we're going to place this into the water. Okay, and then we're going to use our spatula to dislodge the stopper. And when that happens, right, the water inside here, right, and the water here are going to balance each other out. There's air pressure that is pushing down on this water here, meaning it's going to also keep the water inside the flask and like push down on the water here to keep the flask full of water inside there. So the water stays inside. All right, and so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna weigh the empty canister. We're gonna get our first measurement now. The mass of the empty canister, let me turn on my balance. Can you see it here? Okay. I won this balance at a conference um, where I estimated the number of M&Ms in a 500 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, this kind of flask, um, to like two away, I guess within two M&Ms, um, and I won this balance, which is a nice one. It weighs, it can measure 600 grams, which the ones in lab are only 200 grams. So pretty proud, one of my proudest moments there. All right, so massive empty can canister, we wanna make sure that it's all dried off, there's no, no, you know, no debris on it. So massive empty canister, 125.06 grams. Go ahead and write that down, massive initial, we're saying that's the initial, right? I, I didn't mean empty, excuse me, this is an empty, pardon me, I meant the initial mass of the canister. canister. 125.06 grams. All right, everyone got that? 125.06 G, lowercase g. Yep, five, six, five, six figs, exactly. All right, so now we'll put this balance to the side. And now we're going to set up our tubing here. So what's gonna happen is we're going to bubble this gas, this butane, up through the flask with this little U-tube here, right? This U 
shaped tube, right? And what's going to happen is the gas is going to displace the water, right? So in that way, so let's want to be careful that none comes out. Kind of just twist it on there so it makes a nice connection, but holding the nozzle up so none comes out. Should be good. I have no, no, you know, <laughs> nothing lit, no candles around here. I have nothing that could ignite spontaneously, I hope, around here. So no risk for catching on fire with the butane here. All right, I do have my goggles on. And now we're going to dip the YouTube up into the mouth of the flask. I don't know if you can see that in there. Yeah, you can see that in there, right? And so, great. So we can go ahead and add the gas because we will get the pressure online. I'm going to look up the barometric pressure in, you know, what, where am I? <laughs> live oak slash, yeah, <laughs> like live oak-ish, um, right? And then um, we'll estimate the temperature too. Unfortunately, I don't have a thermometer, but all right, we'll do that in a minute. Okay, so now we're going to add the gas. And what we're going to do is add it until it's around that level of the tape so that I can mark the level of the gas, right, what it's displaced in this flask when we're ready. You can see the letter, the level of water in the beaker rising. So I'm looking on the side and I'm seeing where that level is. And so I'm going to stop when I'm sure that it's within the tape range. All right, so now I can take the two out. And here's the thing, here's the trick that we have to do now. In order to say, that the atmospheric pressure, all the pressure, the atmospheric pressure is the pressure of all the gases <laughs> um, in the atmosphere colliding with the, oh my gosh, colliding with the surface of the earth, colliding with the surface of all the things in my house right now, colliding with the surface of you, with everything else on this planet. And we are able to say that the atmospheric pressure is equal to this pressure of this gas as long as the level of this water is equal to the level of the water inside the flask, right? There's still some, a little water in the flask, right, that I've let stay in there around the, the level of the tape. So if we, <coughs> excuse me, raise this flask so that the level of water inside the flask is equal to the level of water outside, then we can say that the pressures are the same. Then we can say that the pressure of the gas pushing on this water inside is equal to the pressure of the atmospheric gases pushing on the water outside. Okay, so that's why we're going to, let me get my marking pencil. That's why we are going to mark, or why we're going to make sure that those two levels are the same. Let's see if I can get this. You can kind of see the shadow of the water inside the flask. Yeah. It's right at the edge of the tape where the two, so I'm glad I got it.
This pencil is working very nicely, marking darkly. All right. So now I've got a marking here that we are going to now fill with water. Pardon me, I know that's bright. We're now going to fill this with water and get this volume because that was the volume of the gas that displaced the water. All right, so we'll fill this to the level that we marked. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And so now, <clears throat> I don't have, <clears throat> excuse me, one of those really big graduated cylinders, but I've got a couple of smaller 100 milliliter ones, so we can add it together. So we'll go to about 100 here. And we're always reading to the bottom of the meniscus. So that is like 100, a little over the 100. So I'm going to say like 100.5. So we're going to add these ones together. So 100.5. Plus, one hundred point two. Um, fifty eight point oh. <clears throat> so when we add those together, we get 258.7 milliliters. I'll dump that out. Actually, we can probably reuse it. Well, yeah, we'll put it back in there. All right. So that's our volume is 258.7 milliliters, okay? All right, so now for the temperature and the pressure. So I'm going to estimate that it's about, let's see, usually in lab, it's like 20.5 degrees, 21 degrees Celsius. I'm gonna say it's, we're just gonna go with 22, let's see. No, 
around the 21.5 degrees Celsius. And then let's look at the barometric pressure today. I'll share my screen with you. I'll we'll say in, I'm like in the unincorporated area. Um, in Pleasure Point, California. Thirty point one eight inches, two millimeters. All right, so here <clears throat> is the barometric pressure. What's going on? What? What? What's going on? Chat, hold on. What's happening? Okay. <laughs> Temperature, yeah, is 21.5. We haven't actually weighed the final mass of the canister. We have to do that too. Thanks for the reminder. All right, we're just finding the pressure right now. We'll go back to that. Thank you for asking. Um, so here is the barometric pressure today in millimeters of mercury. What this means is that, that the pressure of the gases in the atmosphere would push liquid mercury into a vacuum, into an evacuated tube, meaning there's no matter in a tube. It would push the mercury up that tube 766 millimeters. That's what that means. So 766.6. And actually, we're going to use the unit of tor because today on your today on your um, table for calculating the pressure of the gas, it uses tor. Okay, so 766.6 tor is the barometric pressure today, and we do have to get the mass right, the final mass of the canister. Let's do that. So I'm going to take off the tube, make sure none escapes. I'm going to dry it off, make sure it's all good, make sure my balance is zeroed. And the final mass, 124.33 grams. Okay. So the mass of the gas that we're going to use, right, we're going to subtract right the final from the initial today so 125.06 minus 124.33 0 0.73 grams is the mass of gas All right. I think we're going to go with 20.8 degrees, actually. I don't think it's quite that hot. We're going to go with 
20.8 degrees. <laughs> Can you make that change? Let's do 20.8 degrees. See, I think that is going to be, um, I subtracted one from the other to get the mass of the gas, but I think 20.8 is more. I got a sweater on. Ooh, I think that that's more like it. Okay. Um, yeah, I weighed it on the balance. Oh, and then I just subtracted. That's the difference, right? Before and after, right? So before and after, right? Before some was let out and after. All right. So, okay. So that's all we need, right? Those are the things that we measure today. Now we're going to go on and do calculations. So would anyone like to clear up any of this part here? Other questions here? <clears throat> yeah, the bigger number minus the smaller number, right? Well, you don't say subtract something by something. You say you subtract this from that. You multiply by, but you subtract this from that. Yeah. The smaller number from the bigger number. Okay. Simple subtraction there. All right. So uh, other questions before we go on? And this is a high pressure day. This is a high pressure day, right? There's a lot of water in the air. I guess that's what that means. I'm just guessing there, <laughs> right? It's more humid out today. My hair, by the way, is a barometer. My hair <laughs> can tell how much moisture is in the air, right? How much more like a something that measures the humidity, but that is correlated to the barometric pressure, right? The atmospheric pressure. All right, so let's calculate first. So we've got the mass of the gas. We've got the volume. We just have to convert that into liters. Can you do that? How many liters? All right, we have to convert that into liters for the PV NRT calculation. What's that in liters? Mm -hmm. Right, divided by 1,000. So let's do that in this maroon color. 0.2587 liters. So we'll use that later. Okay, cool. So yeah, let's do our first thing. We have to calculate the pressure of the gas. So we'll do that in blue. Okay, let me, uh, hold on. <laughs> I need to remember that too. Um, so I'll write it down. All right, so let's continue.
first thing you need to do is calculate the pressure of the gas because when you bubble the butane through the water, inevitably some water vapor will come into the flask with it, right? Water is evaporating, you know, constantly and you know, evaporating, condensing, evaporating, condensing. So if you're bubbling butane through that water, some of that water vapor is going to come up with it. So we don't want to calculate the pressure of the water vapor, right, in that sample of gas. You only want to calculate the pressure of the butane in that sample. So first things first is calculate pressure of the gas. All right, and when you look in your lab, you see on page 84, there is a chart. There is a chart that tells us the pressure of water vapor, right, at certain temperatures. So our temperature today, we said was 21.8 degrees Celsius. We don't have a 21.8, but we have 21 and we have 22. So we are figuring out, and this is in TOR, by the way, TOR is the unit named for a scientist named Torricelli. Um, Tor is equal to millimeters of mercury. So the barometric pressure that we just got um, from the internet, that's also equal to millimeters of mercury. So we can use Tor here in this table, right, as well as the barometric pressure that we got from the internet, okay? So what we can do is calculate the pressure of the water vapor at that temperature and plug it into a calculation. So it also tells you, right, that on page 81, the pressure of the gas is equal to the atmospheric pressure, right, minus the pressure of the water vapor in the sample that kind of got carried up with it when it bubbled through right? Because the total pressure, right, of the atmospheric gases oops, <laughs> is equal to the pressure of the gas in the flask and the pressure of the water vapor. And we can subtract the pressure of the water vapor from the atmospheric pressure to just get the pressure of the gas. So this is the equation that we can use to get the pressure of the gas. Um, remember when we lifted up the flask to make sure that the two levels of water were at the same level, inside and outside, that, remember, was what allowed us to make the assumption that the atmospheric pressure is equal to the pressure of the gases inside that flask. But we only want it for our butane, not for the water vapor, so we can subtract the pressure of the water vapor from the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure of the gas is equal to the atmospheric pressure minus the pressure of the water vapor. This right here, right, was that 766.6 torr. Here we want to look, and this was um, from the weather report. right, from the weather report that we got online. Here, we need to look at chart on page 83. Nope. On page 84. Didn't I change it? I changed the temp on the border to 20.8. What did I, what did I put? Did I say? Oh, I said 21.8, I meant 20.8, thank you. 20.8, thank you. 20.8 degrees, okay, so that's what we use. All right, so good. So we're gonna look at the chart on page 184. So we see that, right for 21 degrees c oops, 20 degrees c 
the pressure is equal to 17.5, right? The water vapor pressure is dependent on the temperature of the water, right? However much, the higher the temperature, the more vapor, right, is present in the sample above the water, right? So at 20 degrees Celsius, that is 17.5 torr. And at 21 degrees Celsius, <clears throat> the pressure of water vapor is 18.6 torr. Right? We need it for 20.8. So what do you think we can do? We need it for 20.8 degrees Celsius. How can we get that? If we take the average of these two, that would give us for 20.5 degrees, right? How can we get it for 20.8? Make a proportion. I don't know how to do that, <laughs> but maybe, maybe, Lexi, if you know, you know, I, I don't know what that, I mean, that's not the way I do it, but that could work. <laughs> we need it for 20.8. We've got 20 and 21. What can we do? Guess, totally. I think proportion is on the right track. I just don't know. exactly what that means but yeah something like that what can we do Maybe, maybe these are all good ways. I only know my one way and I'm sticking with it. All right, so if we divide this difference, so we'll check it out. If we take 18.6 minus 17.5, right, we get 1.1 tor. And then if you divide that by 10 and then multiply by eight, that'll give you the degree, right, the tor for 20.8, right? We divide by 10, right? That'll give us a tenth between, right? And we need eight tenths between for our 20, right? 0.8 degrees Celsius. So if we divide this by 10, we get 0 0.11. And if we then multiply by eight, we get 0 0.88. So we can add that on to 17.5. So 17.5 plus 0.88 equals 18. Three, eight, four. Yeah, you got it. So how did you do it, Janet, to do that? Did you do a similar thing or how did you get that? Do you care to share how you got that, Yanid? Um, yeah, I found like what one Celsius uh, was equal to one tor. So it was 1.1 and then I divided that to find out what 0.5 was equal to and that was 0.55 tors. So then 
that means that 0 0.1 Celsius would equal 0 0.11. And then we need a um, 20.8. So I multiply that by eight and that would yeah, give me the point eight. Yeah. yeah, exactly what we did here. Awesome. Yeah. Great. So you got the difference, right? Divided by 10, you got 0 0.11. So a tenth of the way between, right, is this difference divided by 10. Yeah. Right? Good. And then you multiply by eight because we needed 20.8. We needed eight tenths yeah. right, of that difference. Great. Good. Yeah. So that works. Um, if you have your proportionality or your multiplying ratio, if that got you the same number, you're, you're welcome to do it that way. Right. That's where that number came from. All right. Yeah, multiply by 0.8 would be the same, yep. And add that, yep, same thing. Yep, that's the same thing. Instead of doing the divide by 10, right, you're multiplying by 0.8, right? Instead of dividing by 10 and multiplying by 8, you're just dividing by 0.8, or multiplying by 0.8, right? Good. So however you can get the difference, right, and split it into parts and add that, right? However many parts you need onto the original pressure will be good. So, <clears throat> excuse me. This really should be 366, right? 366. But we'll use that before we round it, all right? It should be 366 because of this having something in the tenths place only. So we really should have just, if we rounded it now, we'd only have something in the tenths place, but let's leave it unrounded till the end. All right, so we can subtract, right, now the pressure of the gas. We'll just do it up here. Is equal to, 766.6 torr minus 18.38 torr. And then we're going to keep that long <coughs> in our calculation later, too. 766.6 minus 18.38, 748.22. Tor. Is equal to the pressure of the gas. Seven forty eight point two two. Right? So the atmospheric pressure today was equal to the pressure of water vapor and our gas, but we only want the pressure of our gas. So we subtract the pressure of the water vapor at the given temperature to get just the pressure of the gas today. Okay. 748.22. So that's what we're going to use. And we're going to, like, we would have to round to the tenths place right? Also because of this subtraction, but we're just going to underline that. So that would be four sig figs there. But we're not going to round until the end, until after we've put it into the gas law equation. Okay, so that's like the biggest calculation besides doing the actual um, ideal gas law calculation right, is calculating the pressure. So make sure you don't forget this. This took up a bulk of the time. We have it all on one board. Um, <coughs> make sure you can go back to that. Right, maybe take a screenshot right now. If you don't have it all, I might do that to remind people if they need a reminder.
Okay. Okay, so now. Questions, I should have asked for questions before I erase that. What questions do you have on that or anything else so far? Oh, of course. <laughs> well, I don't have the screenshot because I <coughs> am mirrored here, so you couldn't, it's backwards. So yeah, that didn't work out the way I wanted it to. So I hope you all have it. Questions so far, questions on that part? Does everyone understand? So my teaching philosophy in lab two is just like making sure that you understand what you're doing at every step because I just remember being in lab and just going through the motions, not being able, I had no, like a lot of the time I didn't know what we were doing at all. I was just doing what they told me to, but you know, I think it's so important to be able to verbalize like what you're actually calculating, why you're calculating this. So why did we do that? Why did we calculate the pressure of the gas? Why did we have to do that calculation? as a summary. Anyone, why did we just calculate that? Why did we have to calculate the pressure of the gas? Why couldn't we just use the atmospheric pressure, the barometric pressure? That's true. Why did we have to calculate? Why did we just have to do that whole calculation? Why did we have to um, calculate the pressure of the gas and not just use the barometric pressure? For sure. But why not just use the barometric pressure? Why did we just go through that whole calculation? No, we use the gas pressure in the formula. So why did we just have to go through that whole calculation? Anyone else? Why did we have to do that? What was the deal with bubbling the gas through the water? No, now that we have the gas pressure, we don't use the barometric pressure anymore. We used the barometric pressure. Yep, we're looking at the pressure of the gas specifically. That's true, but why couldn't we just use the barometric pressure? Why did we have to go through that whole subtraction calculation? For sure, but why? Why is it different? Right, because the pressure of the water involved too, exactly. So when we just got the um, gas bubbled in there and we equilibrated the volumes, right, we lifted it up and made that mark, that told us at that point that the atmospheric pressure, right, pushing down on the water outside was the same as the pressure of the gases pushing on the water inside. But it was gases, it was butane and water vapor, right? We only wanted the pressure of the butane. So we had to subtract the pressure of the water vapor. That's why we had to do that, right? We didn't want the water vapor involved in the pressure, right? That's why now our pressure of the gas is lower, right? It's 748.22 torr instead of 766.6 torr, 
right? So in that sample of gas as it bubbled through, water vapor was also exerting a pressure and we took that out of the equation. So that's why. Does that make sense? And if not, you can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. There's these reactions, right? You can do reactions um, on the bottom of the video. What are your reactions? I can see them in gallery view. All right. Do you see that at the bottom there? Okay. Good, good. All right. Thank you. And no one else can see them. I don't think, right? So you can be honest. Thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay. All right. So mainly thumbs up. Okay. So let's continue. Thank you for hanging in there. Okay. Let's do the next one. Okay. So now let's calculate moles. So we needed to calculate pressure because of the mixture of gases. We didn't want them mixed. We only wanted butane. Now let's use the molar gas, molar <laughs> ideal gas law to calculate the number of moles. So PV equals nRT. We rearranged for n is equal to PV over RT. So we had pressure in blue. Moles were in green. We had volume in that burgundy color. And we'll put temperature in red. All right. So we want to get moles, so then we can calculate the molar mass because we have the mass too, and that's going to come in later. All right. So we can set this up, right? All right. The pressure we set was 420, I mean, 748.22. Oh wait, I'm sorry y'all, hold on a second. We have to do one more calculation for the pressure. Let's do some conversions down here. <coughs> right? So make sure. You have the correct units. Right? For pressure. We need atmospheres for volume. We need liters. For temperature, we need Kelvin. So let's do those calculations. So 700 and 48.22 tor. can be converted to atmospheres because one atmosphere is equal to 760 tor, and that's three sig figs there. Okay, so we can do that conversion. One atmosphere is equal to 760 tor. So 748.22 is still in my calculator, divided by 760. 0.9845 atmospheres. Okay, so that's where we're going to plug in up here. 
zero point nine eight four five atmospheres. Right. We can write out the calculation for the volume calculation. It was two fifty eight point seven milliliters. And we divided by 1,000 because one liter is equal to 1,000 milliliters, right? So we divide by 1,000 and we get 0 0.2587 liters. And so that's going to go here, 0 0.2587 liters. And by the way, this title, so the title here, right, of this whole thing is calculating moles. Before it was calculating pressure. This whole calculation is calculating moles so that we can get one step closer to being able to calculate the molar mass. Okay, so we've got the volume in liters. Now we need the temperature in Kelvin. How do we do that? Does anyone remember like way back in the beginning, I said that that calculation wasn't gonna be really useful until we get to the gases chapter in lecture. How do you calculate Kelvin from Celsius? Anyone remember? Okay. You just add, you add 273.15 Kelvin, right? Yep, exactly. So zero degrees Celsius is equal to, so the freezing point, right, of water at zero degrees Celsius is equal to 273.15 Kelvin. Zero Kelvin, negative 273.15 Celsius is absolute zero, where molecular motion ceases to exist. Hasn't been, as far as I know, reached yet. Maybe it has, but anyway, yeah. All right, so we have to add 273.15 to get to Kelvin. So 293.95 Kelvin. 293.95. And then R. R is equal to 0 0.018821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. And that's why we need all of our units in this, in the units that we have here, right? Atmospheres, liters, and Kelvin, because of the fact that R, the universal gas constant, is in these units, right? Uses these units. So that's liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin, right? It has a quotient for the unit, just like grams per milliliter, or grams per mole, or meters per second squared, right? Meters per second, right? It's got a quotient for the unit. All right, so we'll plug that in here. 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin, right? And then everything, all the units should cancel out. So we've got liters on the top, and liters on the top over here, they cancel, right? We've got atmospheres and atmospheres. We've got Kelvin and Kelvin, right? We're left with moles 
on the denominator of the denominator, which means it's inverse, so moles will be on top, and that's the unit that we're attempting to calculate. So let's do that. What I would do to make sure that everything goes in the calculator correctly is I would put parentheses around the top, right? Do that multiplication in parentheses, then divide by this multiplication in parentheses on the bottom. So go ahead and plug that in and see what we get for calculating moles. we get yeah cool all right so we're going to keep it long we're just going to underline where we would have to round based off of the sig figs from up here all right so There would be three sig figs here due to this three right here, right? There would be four here. This number is an exact number. So when you're calculating, right, from Celsius, you're actually looking at the least precise place of the Celsius measurement. So this tenths place is where we would have to round to here if we did which would be four sig figs, right? And then we've got three sig figs here. So if we were going to round our moles, how many sig figs would we round to? If we were rounding right now, so yeah, it's 0 0.01, 055, et cetera. Yeah, we would. Round to three, but let's keep it long until the very end. Okay. So that's the number of moles. I'll give you a second to make sure you have everything down if you haven't already gotten it. Questions on this part? Any Anything at all? Anything unclear? I want to make sure everything makes sense and everything. All right, so we've got our moles. So now let's calculate molar mass. Let's 
We'll do that in purple, bluish purple. So how are we going to do this? How are we calculating molar mass? Yeah, exactly. Our mass from the beginning. So what's our mass from the beginning? How many grams? Mm -hmm. 0.73 grams. All right, and then we have our moles, so 0 0.01, 0 0.55, etc. So that was 3, 4, 7, 6. So what do we got? And how many sig figs do we need? Tell me the final molar mass with the correct number of sig figs. Where is four coming from? Where is three coming from? What's the fewest sig figs in this division right here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what's the final molar mass? There should be two sig figs, right? Because there's two sig figs here. There should be three here. Two there. So what do we get? What's the unit? Yeah. 69 grams per mole. All right, so the theoretical molar mass of butane, C4H10, carbon has a molar mass of 12.011 grams per mole. Hydrogen has a molar mass of 1.0079 grams per mole. So with the correct number of sig figs, what is the molar mass of butane theoretically? Mm-hmm, 58.123 grams per mole.
This is theoretical molar mass. So this we can use to calculate the percent error. Yeah, nice work everyone, All right? So percent error, is equal to the absolute value of the experimental minus the theoretical over the theoretical and you multiply that by 100%. Okay, that's the percent error calculation. So I want everyone to show me the molar mass for the next one and the percent error. And if, if these are within 10% of each other, you're the next one that we do when you do the calculations in this one. So if you get like 60, you know, two grams per mole or 70, you know, six grams per mole, that would be within 10% of each other, right? Just point within 6.9 grams per mole of each other. Then you would calculate the average, but I at least want this box top, right? And I want the percent error, okay? So in this case, everyone's got this down. It's actual minus theoretical or actual meaning experimental. So let's plug those in. And we'll use the rounded one because that's like our final molar mass. So let's plug it into the percent error calculation. So zero, <laughs> 69 minus 58.123 divided by 58.123. Right, that is the theoretical molar mass of butane C4H10. Okay, we have to do it in steps because it is a combined operations problem. So again, another good example of where you'll have to stop and underline where you would round and then take those six things into account. So 69 minus 58.123. Is 10. 0.877. All right. So that's subtraction. All right. So we're looking at the least precise place. It's the ones place here in the 69. So we would have to round to this place here, the ones place, because that's the least precise place for the subtraction. Right. And then for the division, the rule we have to follow is the fewest significant figures. Right? And so we've got two sig figs here. After we underline that, that would be the second sig fig. Right. And 58.123 is five sig figs. So our final percent error should have two sig figs. So 10.877 divided by 58.123. Is it big percent error? 1.18.7 times 100 is 19% error.
19% error. So that is pretty, and multiply by 100%, right? That's pretty big, that's a pretty big error. So where do you think it came from? What was the one thing that was estimated <laughs> very unscientifically? Yeah, the temperature, and does that make sense? Was the temperature estimated to be too high or too low today? What do we think? Was the temperature estimated to be too high or too low today? What does everyone else think? Too high or too low when you're looking back up here? Yeah, right? Because the higher this temperature, the lower the number of moles, right? Meaning lower number here. So when you divide by a lower number, the more mass will be bigger. Exactly. So we're gonna make up another temperature next time, <laughs> a little bit lower. <laughs> Let me write this all down. All right, so good. So good thing I didn't go higher. Good thing I didn't say 21.5, right? This is a 20.8, so we'll lower it next time. All right, so good questions here before we do the next one. So we're gonna do the next one together to get the data and then you're gonna go through all these calculations. And so I said, you'll do two more trials. We'll actually just make this trial one Okay, and then the next one that we do together will be trial two. That's fine. So thanks for sticking with it. Any questions here at all? Anything you'd like me to clear up? Anything you don't understand where it came from? This is pretty dark, pretty light. 58.123 is the theoretical molar mass with the correct sig figs. All right. Okay. Well, let's do the next one. We'll make our same table. All right. Trial two. Mass canister initial mass canister final we have volume temperature and pressure atmospheric pressure barometric pressure it'll be the same Okay. So we use the same atmospheric pressure. Sorry, that's so late. I'm going to add ink to the marker. So the barometric pressure again is 766.6 torr.
All right, and let's do it again. I have the initial mass of the canister still on my balance right now. So we'll just get the initial mass. Right now it says 124.34. So we'll get that right now, 124.34, initial. All right, and then I'll move my camera so you can see. All right, so I'm just going to reuse the water. I do have to get my stopper out. Fill with water to the brim. And this has a little too much. I'm going to pour out the rest. And then we will place the stopper into the Erlenmeyer flask. This is an Erlenmeyer flask, so no air bubbles are trapped. E-R-L-E-N-M-E-Y-E-R. -E that in there. No air bubbles, so we know at least no air is also playing a role in the pressure of the gas here. Place that face down. Dislodge the stopper. All right. Now we are going to right, set up the tube. So we already have the initial mass of the canister. I'm gonna set up the tube. Place that inside the tube, I mean inside the flask, make sure the tube is in there. All right, then we're going to add the gas so that it displaces the water. All right. Take out the tube. Be careful not to let any out. I'm going to dry it off, make sure no water is on it, and get the mass of the canister final.
123.71 grams. 123.71. All right. Now we're going to mark, we're going to raise the flask so that the level of the water outside is equal to the level of the water inside. Kind of can see the shadow of the water inside. So All right. So now we fill the Erlenmeyer flask with water up to that level. I'm just going to use this water this time. And then measure that volume. Go. Now let's see. We're gonna use the two graduated cylinders again. I'll try to get below the 100 this time so that doesn't become an error. All right, so we've got 90. 8.0 milliliters plus 98.9 plus 54.8. So we add those together, and that is definitely a source of error, right? The fewer measurements you have to make, the better, but that's all we have. So 98 plus 98.9 plus 54.8. 251.7 milliliters. All right. Now the temperature. Let's see. Let's also get the. Well, you can do that actually. Massive gas. You can figure that out. Oops. <clears throat> Go over here now. <laughs> okay. Again, seven sixty six point six four. Okay, you figure out the mass of the gas by taking the difference between the two. And let's see, I'm going to look at back at our caps real quick.
All right. We're going to go with a temperature of I'm just going to do this 19.1 degrees Celsius. We'll see what that does for us. <laughs> okay, that's what you'll use for your temperature. Okay, so we have all the measurements. All right. So we're going to go into breakout rooms. And you can calculate those things before. Um, we do that. Just want to remind people to check in with each other, say hi, you know, ask how everyone's doing in your group. Um, and then for an icebreaker, you can talk about, oh, let's see. I don't know. What's a good icebreaker? Um, the favorite, your like go to meal these days. What has been your go-to or like your go-to snack or something, right? Something that you've been enjoying eating or making right now, okay? Um, so great. Okay, so let's do that. And again, when you need help or when you're done and you want me to check your calculation, you click ask for help on the bottom and I'll come into your breakout room. And so I want you to calculate the molar mass. and the percent error. Okay, that's what I want you to calculate for this trial here. Trial two. All right. So, Let's go for it and break up into breakout rooms. Anything you want to ask before we go? So we can talk about it with everyone. Is everything okay? Are you feeling okay about this? Anything you want to make sure that you're set with before we go forward? Can you give me a thumbs up or thumbs down on your reaction on the bottom there? Oh, there's no thumbs down. <laughs> well, I didn't know that, but give me a thumbs up if it's okay. If it's not, don't put anything. Converting things, George? So you're, you're concerned about that part? Right, remember to convert, exactly. So that the whole board that we had with, you know, going back to that, if you wrote everything down where for, you know, how to do the pressure calculation was one whole board, right? And then going step by step to make sure that your volume is in the right units, your temperature is the right units, right? The pressure needs to be converted after you do the first pressure calculation, right? So yeah, remember to convert. So hopefully you have all your notes written down, okay? Exactly, okay. So let's do breakout room. 